It seems strange to come back to a place after almost 50 years, but this small Herefordshire village is where I first came across real farmhouse cider. You see, my father used to be the country vicar here, and as a four-year-old boy, I'd uh, accompany him on his walks as he went around to see his parishioners. In those days, it seemed that all of them, householders, cottagers and farmers, had a barrel of farmhouse cider tucked away in some cool cellar or pantry. And believe you me, on a hot summer's day, how refreshing it used to be. Old Mr Pudge, who used to live in this farmhouse here, always had marvellous cider, and it was a pleasure to take a couple of glasses with him. And then it was off with me dad for a couple more somewhere else. Yes, those pastoral visits were always great fun. Your glass is the cider Oh, and let the hell go round May the apple tree forever stand Now drink your liquor down It's cool and it's clear and it's golden And it tastes like rare old wine And it comes from the juice of the apple, me boy Herefordshire is one of the prime cider producing areas in this country. The reason is the county's rich fertile soil and also its westerly position, which means the delicate apple blossoms escape any late frosts. Cider is one of the oldest drinks known to man and was certainly being made in this country long before the arrival of the Romans. In the 14th century, the church became somewhat concerned with the uses cider was put to. Bishop William of Shoreham issued an edict. Children were not to be baptised with cider. Hereford Cathedral stands over the county town and is known throughout the world for its famous chained library. The 12th century Wycliffe Bible, which is kept there, uses the warning, Beware of the evils of strong cider. Other Bibles of the period simply refer to the evils of strong drink. Here we come a wassailing among the leaves of green. Here we come a wandering so fairly to be seen. Oh, it's winter time, strangers travel far and near, and we wish you, send you a happy new year. Down the century, cider making has been a craft of the cottage and the farmhouse. It was as much a part of country life as baking one's own bread and salting down the pig to see you through the lean winter months. Bags and all and the cider running out of every gutter In cider growing areas, all country people had their cider apple trees in the orchards and around their cottages. The cider fruit is quite unlike the dessert apple, which goes so well with a bit of bread and cheese. Instead, it's tart, bitter and tough, and it's these qualities that give to cider its distinctive and refreshing bite. Cider's also one of the most simple drinks to make. The fruit is crushed in a mill, and then the pulp is pressed between layers of rough sacking to extract the juice. Those who couldn't afford their own mill and press hired in the travelling cider maker with his mobile equipment. During the harvest season, they travelled throughout Herefordshire, dealing with everyone's needs. 
For the farm labourers, hours were long and the wages low, and part of their wages was paid in cider. They were paid um, about a fifth of their wages, and they would take the cider in the fields in a wooden barrel like this. It was called a costrel. It's a small cask, as you can see, bound in iron, and they would drink from a horn mug of a kind like this, which very often had the initials of the labourer on it. So I suppose it was very important for each individual farmer to make good cider for his workers. Well, not necessarily. The farmer very often would make good cider for himself, and a second pressing would be the cider which was given to labourers. Was there great drunkenness in the hayfields? A great deal. In fact, um, there was a commission during the 19th century, in fact in the 1860s, whereby an investigation was made into the amount of cider which was drunk. And the reformers really had a problem because it was in the farmers' interest to give cider to the labourers. And it was the opinion of many landowners that they could not get the harvest in unless cider or beer was supplied. So did this lead to lots of accidents? It did indeed. A Somerset surgeon wrote an appalling description of how so much alcohol was given, limitless quantities in some cases, to the labourers, that accidents would happen in the field. He recorded one instance where they would fall off the back of a cart and be run over, they would slide off a rick and be impaled on a hay fork, and in fact he said there was so much tumbling around in the hay fields that accidents were frequent. Yet despite this, in 1763, when the cider tax was imposed, the local people virtually went into revolt. Well, by that time, cider was a very important product. It was being produced in very large quantities. It was being shipped to London and Bristol, and it had become so successful that it was an obvious source of income to Lord Bute, the then Prime Minister, to help pay for the Seven Years' War. And so he imposed this tax in 1763, and the reaction from the cider counties was um, immediate. The Worcester Barrow's Journal recorded that the farmers of Ledbury marched through the town dressed in cider hairs with a barrel on a beer, and the bells were muffled all day. And the same summer, in Hereford, the farmers made an effigy of Lord Butte in straw, hung it on a pillory and burnt it on a bonfire. So the reaction in the cider counties was very great, and it took the efforts of the local member of parliament, Sir Veltas Cornwall, to get the act repealed, which was done in 1766. Rejoice is welcome news, come let us merry be. Since George, our gracious king, in his great clemency, so kindly has consented his subjects once to ease by taking off the cider tax which does the kingdom please. Then let the merry bells ring in every village round And naught but joy and harmony in every place be found Come jolly hard and we'll lay by a pie Once a year in the little village of Tarrington, the locals come together and get the old mill and press working again. It's been there for 400 years and is a museum piece in itself. Good morning. <coughs> if you live nearby, you take your apples along and they all go into the communal pile. For the locals, it's a great day out, and others come from miles around to have a good look and see the master at work. Dolly the horse looks forward to it as well, and after years plodding around the mill, her bones and harness creak as much as the great wooden spindle and cogs. Normally overseeing the operation is old Charlie Holbrook, who's been making cider all his life. There can't be many mills like this one left. The majority of them gone, like um, broken up and put on uh, lawns and things like that. Not many of them left around. Not in working use, like that. No, very few. Would this be the last one? This area is the best is around there. There's odd ones, but they're not in very good shape, like, you know. The old mills are there, but they wouldn't be in working order. A lot of them, anyway. Like, you know. Of course, you can remember working these in the old days. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've seen a few thousand gallons go through these old mills? Oh, they drunk a drop. And it, no, don't hurt anybody. Like a bloke, he said, um, 
He was down in the churchyard, and old copper come along. He said, "By God," he said, "You've been here a long time." He said, "You got to move from me." That's why he got in. So I try to move some of these other buggers who've been here blaze side longer than me, because they were all dead, of course. But he was alive. Who one got up the next morning? Old piece on the avenue man. Boy, gone with nothing to him. He drink it. Big man. He lived to be 92. Never heard him see. He'd have cider for breakfast, cider for dinner, and cider for supper. But it's a pure cider, no chemicals. The chemicals are there is killing, putting people on the cider and all, like a beard and all. These are heavy pieces of machinery. Do you ever remember any accidents with them? Only a bloke falling in front of the horse, an old horse head jogged over the top of him. He's lucky. The horse was very good. He could have been killed with it, but the horse just, he fell down. Look, he had much drink in him. He didn't know where he was. When do you reckon I'll be ready for drinking? Oh, Christmas would be nice. Remember a bloke saying once, he said he was sour. He said it took three to hold him to drink it. But he was sour. They hadn't made it right. You make it properly, it's all right. Boy, God, it'd make you shock a bit, but he was thirsty in the summer, but in the winter, it choked him. Sour, like vinegar, like, you know. But it's made out of old um, bramley. This is a proper cider fruit, see? Will anything be added to this when it's in the barrel? Nothing at all, no. Might chuck a few raisins in it to get it to work. Sometimes get a bit obstinate, but it mostly works, all right? This will be the actual delicious, oh, good God. I hope the Lord spares me to have a drop of it. Right, God, I... No, Parson, he loves a drink down here. Beautiful, he said, on the cannon. Beautiful cider, a couple of years ago, well. No, see, why, why they shouldn't have a drink as well as anybody else. Okay, Charlie, do you think this is ready? It's absolutely perfect, David. Couldn't be better. I have heard it said, Charlie, that in the old days, a lot of the old farmers used to put water into the cider from the duck pond. Oh, it's beautiful. Better than all the pure rainwater, pump water. Fermented, oh, it's beautiful. I think the old ducks made a wonderful job of it. And the old farmers, they wouldn't have nothing different. No ducks enjoyed it, of course, on the pool and the throw out and in the barrel and everything was all right. And uh, chuck a bit of an old lump of meat in the barrel, all beef-like. Some of you couldn't eat sometimes. The bloke said it was baby beef. My grandfather said, I think it's 30 year old. Chuck that in a bloody cider at it. Oh, it ate it all up. Of course, the cider was eaten up. Delicious cider was. Between the old ducks on the pool and the and the old beef, it was, boy, God, he took some beef in. But that rat job, I never heard of that, putting rats in. Well, he don't like a sauce, I wouldn't put him in with you. Oh, I don't think of that was... I have heard of that, but i never known it. I remember a mouse getting in, top of a barrel, but he come out a bit quick, the fumes he got out from them, mind, a bit sharp. Characters like Charlie add to the flavour of the occasion, and so do his stories. Believe them or believe them not, many of them are true. It was tradition to throw a lump of meat into the barrel to give it clarity and an extra bit of body. Cider, when it's fermenting, will eat its way through anything, bones and all. When the juice comes from the press, it doesn't look anything like cider. This is the making of what's known as scrumpy, the real old rough stuff. With a bite like an adder and a kick like a mule, it's a lethal concoction. And those who are not versed in the ways of the countryside should tread carefully. To go too rash can mean a sudden collapse in the nearest hedgerow or ditch. Not bad, Charlie. I hope that puts them in my coffin when I'm dead. <laughs> Couldn't be better, it's good. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. What a beautiful blossom this is. I've never seen anything like this all 70 years that I've been in the side of business. Never in my life have I seen apples like this. Uh, Look at this here now. 
Here's, here's the blossom, and there's the buds. Now every bud is firm and will stick. Now, for years and years, you could go up to the blossom and touch the, the buds and they drop off, and only one probably would remain on. But these are all sticking. There's gonna be a terrific crop of fruit on, on these. I should think it'll be the heaviest crop of fruit in living man. I should estimate this particular little tree here will produce anything up to two to three hundred weight of apples. And I don't know how many apple trees are here, but this, it'll, it'll amount to several hundreds of tons. Uh, and uh, we shall be able to enjoy the pleasure of making this, the juice here, and it'll go all over the country and everybody will be enjoying themselves. And we here watching the blossom and apples growing. Bill, it's amazing to think that your family's been making cider since the days of the Civil War. Oh yes, um, the family can go back many years, go right back into the 16th century. Um, cider making's in the blood and it's always been in my blood too. When I was a boy, about uh, three years of age, we were, the children were playing around the, the mill and I fell in a, in a vat from the presses and it was about four feet deep. And I went down three times, and they shouted, and uh, one of the men were work, having their lunch in the, in the building next door, and he came and pulled me out. So I, you can see I was baptized in cider, and I've been cider ever since. So you're lucky to be with us. I am lucky to be with you. <laughs> the thing is, Bill, why did you fall in the bat? Well, we, it was a, a quite a, a big thing in those days that the children we used to get the straws, uh, the wheat straws, you know, and break them off and, and go around these uh, vats and suck the cider out of it because it was so nice and sweet. We even, the children used to come home from school and creep into the farmyards with other farms where they were making cider and get these straws and suck the cider uh, 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 out, out of the barrels with the straw. Oh, it was nice. In the 1920s, cider was becoming more popular with people in the towns. So the commercial growers started laying down orchards not with the old standard trees, but the modern bush variety. Tim, why have cider apple growers gone over to these small bush trees? Really, because uh, one can get much earlier returns uh, from this type of orchard. A standard orchard one would probably have to wait anything up to 15, 18 years to get a good crop. Uh, with the bush trees, planting them as closely as this, up to 200 trees to the acre, uh, it's possible to get a good crop in about the 8th to 10th year. That's the main reason, really. But you get as many apples to the acre in tonnage? Yes, in fact, I believe we're getting an increased tonnage with these bush trees at the moment. How much of Herefordshire is now under the bush apple? It's about 3,500 acres of uh, bush apples now grown. Virtually all between the ages of 14, 7 to 14 years of age. So it's fairly young, of course, really since the early 70s. So has the big standard cider apple tree disappeared? By no way. No, we've still, I should think, got four and a half to 5,000 acres of uh, standard orchards as well in the county. And we still rely very much on the fruit from those orchards. Of course, some of the old cider apples had marvelous names, didn't they? Slack me girdle and uh, Bishop's wimple and sheep's nose. Yes. Uh, have all those disappeared uh, with these new varieties? The specific ones you mentioned have disappeared, but the varieties that we are growing, in fact, are still the old cider varieties. It's just that we've selected about 15 varieties from the three or 400 that are actually known. Uh, we've selected these varieties because they are heavy croppers, uh, reasonably resistant to certain diseases and pests, and obviously give us good crop and a good range of varieties that we can blend for the ciders that we produce. Uh, varieties uh, with such names as Tremlett's Bitter, Yarlington Mill, Brown Snout, uh, Vilbury, that's the, the type of varieties that we are growing at the moment. Uh, I noticed over there you had some beehives. Are the bees important? Yes, they are in fact vital to our uh, production of, uh, of fruit. It's an insurance policy. If we've had very bad weather for this last fortnight or so, uh, we are relying literally on perhaps today and tomorrow for these bees to do their duty of transferring the pollen from flower to flower. 
if, if we didn't have the bees, um, the chances are that one, this wouldn't happen naturally because you've got a very high intensity of blossom in this area and the natural insect activity is, is far too low. So you have to farm them in? So we bring in bees into the orchards, usually at about 30% blossom when the blossom's just starting to open, bring the hives into the orchards, mm -hmm. the bees then will come out of their hives and start to do their job of uh, moving from flower to flower. And how much honey do you get every year? Three and a half to four tons each year. The large cider makers like Bulmers have developed their own specialised equipment to speed the harvest. This is called the shaker. It's rather like a large pair of lobster claws fitted on the front of a tractor. They grip the small trunk and send a burst of exciting shivers through its timbers. Apples are scattered everywhere, so along comes the blower, operating rather like a vacuum cleaner in reverse. Cider apples are swirled into neat lines. Next, it's the turn of the sweeper. Patrolling between the rows of trees, it brushes up the apples and drops them into a following trailer. The cider factories are standing by waiting to take in the harvest. The operation is on a huge scale and juggernauts like this one spill out 20 tonnes of apples at a time. The apples are washed and then crushed in giant machines. But the cheese is still made up by hand. Layers of crushed apple folded into layers of coarse sacking. Then down comes the hydraulic press, squeezing with a pressure of 2,000 pounds to the square inch. After fermenting, the cider is stored for maturing in these huge oak vats. By tradition, the vats all have names. I wonder how much vat Maggie's going to put on this one. The first cider we've got today for tasting is the uh, first fermentation from the new season. It's a little young, but uh, I think you'll find it quite Very promising. Bulmers holds a weekly tasting panel where the experts are able to judge quality and the fermentation and decide what blending needs to be done between the various vats. What do you think of that, Jim? Good clean nose? Mm, very good. Rather like tea tasting, it always seems such a waste to spit it out. And believe you me, that's uh, not as easy as it looks. When a factory is dealing with hundreds of millions of gallons of cider, nothing can be left to chance. So today, the chemist is an important part of the operation monitoring the progress of the cider from the crushing to its final maturation. Well, in the old days, ciders were fermented as they came and they could well have had um, unwanted yeasts on them which would give uh, strange flavours. So you never knew when you did a fermentation whether it was going to taste uh, first class or be quite undrinkable. So what happens these days? Well now, of course, we use our own culture of yeast, which we've isolated from local fruits and which we know to be a strong fermenter and to give the kind of flavour that we need. 
So from what you said, in the old days, the small country farmer's batch of cider could be very much a hit and miss affair. Very much so, and it probably still is in some cases. Cider is packaged in all sorts of ways. Wooden barrels, steel flasks, cans, and of course the well-known flagon. The speed at which they're filled and capped is breathtaking, and so is the din. Close by the factory is Hereford's own Museum of Cider, the only one of its kind in the world. Visitors can wander through and see cider making equipment, some of it over 300 years old. The museums run as a charity and of course they're always on the lookout for interesting pieces. There are also superb antique books with hand-coloured plates showing the varieties of cider apples once grown throughout the county. Cider brandy made by distilling cider was once common in Herefordshire. Now the museum has the only legal cider still operating in Britain. Visitors always stop to see the cooper at work. Ray Cottrell is one of a dying breed and finds there's more work waiting for his craftsmanship than he can readily cope with. I started work at 15 and uh, I think there was something like about eight coopers in this county then. I'm, I'm the last one now um, still working or still practicing the trade. Most of my work now involves repair and maintenance of casks. I do make quite a few uh, new ones, but they become rather expensive and more or less for the connoisseurs. Nobody really wants to take up this job now because of the length of the apprenticeship, which is six years. If there was somebody, I'm pretty sure that he would be a rich man when he's my age. Look at the trees, the branches on the ground. Have you ever seen anything like it before? No, I haven't. It's, it's absolutely one of the heaviest crops I think in living memory. It's, uh, the trees were very loaded with blossom, and I said at the time that the, I forecast a very heavy crop of fruit, and I think I'm dead right here, and here's the example for it. I think we've got a better future in the cider business than ever we have had before because cider was only drunk on the farm for the old gaffers. Huh? But now it's got into the towns and, uh, and the better class people are drinking cider, the educated people are drinking cider. Whereas before it was uh, the, the, the working class folks had to a cheap drink and it was their drink. But it's no longer a cheap drink, it's even dearer than beer now. But as long as they can get fruit like this and make good cider, they'll sell it. And the ladies will come along and drink it, the young ladies. The young girls are the ones that like it, the young ladies. It keeps them fit, slim, ideal. Better than taking drugs. There were no more going to the doctors and buying pills and all sorts of things to get their weight off. It's you're in the apple. And there's nothing better than an apple to keep fit. And these orchards will produce all the juice I think we want. Drink your liquor down And a woman who hasn't a husband But fancies a man by her side Should drink up a glass of good cider And then she'll soon become a blushing bride So lift up your glasses to cider And let the help go round the apple tree forever stand Now drink your liquor down Thank you very much. <laughs>